guys, Nathan from Arms and Armor here. Uh, today, I want to talk to you about Damascus steel. Right? We often get asked if we can make swords in Damascus steel. Uh, the answer is, if you really want to pay for it. Uh, but there's this kind of idea out there that Damascus steel is the best steel uh, for swords. And I want to talk today a little bit about the reality of that and the history of it and uh, what kind of facts and scientific research we actually have uh, to think about composite steels. Right. So when people are asking about Damascus steel, what are they asking about? Right. Usually what they're asking about is modern pattern welded steel in which you take two different kinds of steel, one that usually has more nickel or phosphorus than the other, and you weld it together in layers, and then pull those layers out and forge uh, a blade. When you do that, and you grind it, and then you etch it, you get these really distinct layers that can be very beautiful. Uh, this is technically called pattern welding, not Damascus steel. Uh, the idea of Damascus steel uh, is kind of <laughs> rooted in history, but it essentially comes from uh, crucible steel that was produced in India or Persia uh, that was sold essentially throughout the Middle East that was created for export as ingots. This was a kind of steel uh, that they were able to produce that had a relatively high iron content. In fact, often higher uh, than what we would want to use for steels today. It produced all kinds of benefits, like the steel was pretty hard, uh, but it also was difficult to work. If you heated it uh, too much, uh, you'd kind of destroy some of those benefits in the production process, and it was kind of this mystical uh, uh, thing, in part because they were able to make hard sword blades at a time when most sword blades in Europe weren't particularly hard. Right? They were pretty malleable. Uh, so what were the Europeans doing at the time? Right? Well, most steel from the Roman period up through about 1400 was produced uh, using bloomery iron. So essentially you'd make a furnace, you'd put a bunch of iron ore in there, You'd heat it, slag would run out, and you'd be left with this kind of spongy cake of mixed iron, a little bit of steel, and a whole bunch of inclusions and slag in there that then you'd have to hammer out, and get the impurities out of, and you'd come out with a chunk of iron. Uh, if you wanted to get steel, the best way to get it from that was to kind of take apart that bloom and look for parts of it that were harder than other parts. Right? So you'd essentially be cutting apart this heterogeneous bloom of iron, looking for the hardest bits. And you'd get a bunch of little scraps of steel out of it. Right? So this method of producing iron and steel mostly produced soft iron with a little bit of steel. And they really, for the most part, didn't know how to produce steel outside of that. Uh, so you would get a little bit of steel and a lot of iron. Uh, that meant that steel was really valuable, right? It was much more durable. Uh, it was much harder. It could potentially be hardened. So if you were making a sword from bloomery iron, you would have a bunch of different pieces of metal with different mechanical and physical qualities, right? Some of it was really soft, some of it was really hard. The hard stuff, the steel, was really expensive. The best thing you could do was make a sword entirely out of hard steel, right? but that was really expensive. Instead, what you would often do is make a sword with an iron core and steel edges. And you did this through what's called piling, where basically you'd take several different pieces of steel and weld them together, forge weld them to get a bar of steel. Hopefully the hard steel would be on the edges and the softer metal would be in the middle, right? Because you want the hard steel on the edge so it holds an edge. Uh, 
during the Dark Ages, the migration period up through the Viking period, this is how a lot of swords were made, and labor was cheap, materials were expensive. So you got this process where they would make a decorative pattern in the center of the blade, essentially by twisting uh, these bars of softer iron. They'd use iron with more phosphorus and less phosphorus to get this kind of pattern in there. And for quite a while, especially from the Victorian period, you know, up through the middle of the 20th century, even into the 80s, there were a bunch of arguments made by academics that this kind of pattern welding, right, this twisting and welding together of these different metals made the steel, the sword, stronger and better than if it were not so uh, twisted and welded, right? That essentially it had functional benefits. So people like Herbert Marion, uh, who was a conservator at the British Museum, who worked in the Sutton Who Dig, right, made a bunch of claims, uh, you know, Ewart Oakshot occasionally mentioned things like this, that these pattern welded swords were superior materially and functionally, right? That somehow twisting and welding these things made something like the strength of a sheet of plywood, right? Instead of a single board, that it made them more flexible, more durable, and all this. Uh, more recently, we've seen that this probably isn't true in most cases. Right? So work by folks like Alan Williams at the Wallace Collection, uh, who wrote uh, The Sword and the Crucible, uh, which is an excellent book you should get, and a whole bunch of academic research articles that have looked at and actually tested these swords have found that pattern-welded blades are almost always weaker and inferior to just plain steel blades. Right? They're not better. Uh, they're pretty but they're not better. Uh, and this is because when you're taking these softer materials that have a whole bunch of slag and impurities in them and then making all of these repeated welds, you're introducing weaknesses throughout the blade. Right? The best sword blades are homogenous right? in that they have a, a, a crystalline structure and a chemical structure and physical properties that uh, don't change super abruptly uh, along them, and that are made of high carbon steel rather than iron. Right? So if we look at you know, so-called Damascus steel, uh, it's usually inferior to uh, more homogeneous steels. Now this isn't to say there's never a reason to use, say, two different kinds of steel right, welded together, one harder than the other. You could. And sometimes that's a good way to go. Right? You can make you know, essentially super swords using two different kinds of modern steel. But those have essentially nothing to do with historical swords. Right? What they were looking for were a set of qualities like the ability to hold an edge, hardness, and toughness. Right? So a sword that could stand up to abuse and not break or bend, right? springiness. Right? Basically, they wanted spring steel. It was highly valued. Uh, also, historically, if we look at European swords, this kind of pattern welding that we see in like modern knife production, uh, which is really cool and beautiful, was very uncommon after, you know, essentially the Viking period. Uh, it was not something that was used in the majority of European swords. And really what they wanted to do was produce a homogenous steel sword uh, because it would work the best. The limiting factor was the scarcity of good steel and their ability to produce it. Pattern welding was a pretty thing to do. Who knows, maybe it had some magical right, thinking attached to it. It was aesthetic, but it probably wasn't super functional. And certainly today, if you make a pattern welded sword, the only reason to do it is if you really like the look of modern Damascus steel. Right? There's really no historical reason to do it, and there's very little functional reason to do it. Hope that answers your questions. Thanks.